I think we'll start. So I'm Helen Bevan, and I work for the National Health Service in England as part of NHS Improving Quality, which is the national improvement body for England. And as part of that, I work in a new team, which is called Horizons Group. And the principle of the Horizons Group is to think about um, very large-scale, radical, transformational change. How might we skip a generation of thinking about large-scale change? And what I'd like to present to you in the next hour is some of the early thinking of the Horizons Group. In terms of what we're going to cover um, in this session, you know, this is very much about looking into the future. But really, we can't talk about the future without framing it in the present and the past. So that's what we're going to start off with. There's lots of fives in this presentation. So there's five transformational forces that are changing the world of change. And then, for us as improvement leaders, I want to cover five ways to thrive and survive in this new world that I'm going to outline. And finally, I, I've t um, I will have told a story of the past and the present, and I would like to end by telling you a story of the future. So I'd like to start off by showing you um, a little film that I made. It's, it's a digital story. And, you know, thinking about and preparing for today and thinking about transformational trends going forward, I recognised that, in a sense, I have to frame my own views about the future in my own experiences in the, in the past and the present. So I made this film to explain that. I was that little kid who was always asking questions and seeking new knowledge, who never sat still and had a burning sense of social justice. I haven't changed. I've spent my whole career on a mission for quality improvement, always leading change from the front. For 20 years, I've been privileged to lead and support local and national improvement initiatives in healthcare, efforts to eliminate patient weights, to improve care for people with cancer and with heart disease, to reduce cost while improving quality, and to put right terrible wrongs like the inappropriate prescribing of antipsychotic drugs to people living with dementia. I've loved linking with people like me from across the globe being a radical, a rebel, a challenger of the status quo can be a very lonely occupation. Sometimes, as an improvement leader, learning comes slowly and incrementally through the sheer weight of experience. Sometimes, learning comes in huge bolts of insight. One of my first big insight moments was learning formal quality improvement methods in the 1980s. I was given a fresh pair of eyes to understand and transform the journey of patients. At one time in a hospital boardroom meeting, I rolled out a 15-foot patient process map drawn on a roll of wallpaper. It showed that it took nine months and 270 process steps to provide nine minutes of clinical care to that patient. And it also gave new eyes to those hospital leaders to see the potential for improvement, and it created energy and a confidence for change. My second revelation crept up on me much more slowly. At first, I thought that the magic of improvement happened because we offered improvement programmes and effective improvement tools to local teams. I realised that the magic didn't come from the programmes and methods. It happened when people got together and solved problems that really mattered to them. I learnt that systems and methods for improvement were important, 
but that inspiring people to want to change rather than have to change was the real magic. I'm proud of the last two decades and what we've achieved as a quality improvement movement. But on its own, the past is not enough to create the future we need. Systems are failing, patients continue to die needlessly, and the gap between where we are now and where we need to be for a viable future healthcare system continues to grow. You see, history also tells us that the very notion of the past as an effective guide to the future is in question. Can we really continue to drive forward using rear view mirrors? So, let's take account of and learn from the past, but not allow it to hijack the potential for a very different future. So, in terms of thinking about the future and framing it in the present and the past, what I wanted to do is to just um, help us all to get into the spirit of that. So what I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you and talk about one of your own experiences in the past that, that is impacting on your view of the future. So tell each other a story. Literally, I'm just going to give you two or three minutes. I'm going to move us on now. What I want to do next is I want to talk about a few global trends in change that are happening across the world, across multiple industries. The first thing that's happening is change is happening at a much faster rate than it used to and is becoming more disruptive. So, you know, we live in a world where there is far less um, incremental change on current models, okay? We're living in a world where change is getting more radical, more disruptive. Secondly, there are a whole range of digital tools that are available to us that enable us to be in almost constant contact with almost anyone anywhere in the world. So our ability to connect and learn and pick up new knowledge is massively accelerated. The third thing that is happening is that the work environment is becoming increasingly complex, which means that the old management styles that did us very well for years and years, based on hierarchy, are becoming less and less effective and are diminishing. Work is changing. Complex work is getting more complex, and we only have to talk to colleagues who work in the front line of care to see that you know, talking to, to people who are working in hospital wards, where, you know, the patients that we see now are far more complex than we used to see um, five years ago, uh, because more people are treated in the community. And conversely, we talk to colleagues in primary care, and they say to us, our workload and the, the, the kinds of care we're providing are far more complex. That isn't ha just happening in healthcare, it's happening across industries. The other thing that's happening is that because the pace of change is... is um, increasing, it means that the, the pace of, at which we have to come up with innovative and creative solutions is also accelerating. Across the world, across industries, what we're seeing is that creative processes, the kind of processes that are linked to innovation and improvement and change, are moving much more close to the edges of our organisations. And what we mean by that is if we want to you know, create radical change, transformation, we can't do that typically in the centre of our organisation, in the middle of a hierarchy within the current mindset. We've got to move those change and innovation processes out to the edges where people have got more freedom to think radical things and to connect with others. So bringing those principles back into our world of health and care, I think we have to conclude you know, that many of the ways that we go about improving health and healthcare were designed in a different mindset for a different set of circumstances and a different era of change. And we need, we need new mindsets, we need new tools, we need new principles. 
And it's interesting because when we look at the kind of general leadership and transformational literature, there are warnings all over the place. And I've just got a couple here um, you know, from, um, from gurus. The first one comes from Gary Hamill. The organizations that survive in the future will be those that are capable of changing as fast as change itself. And then Jack Welsh, you know, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. And it's interesting to me because I've worked in a lot of national improvement organizations um, in the National Health Service in England. And when those, the kind of the demise of those organizations is coming and people are starting to question them, it's typically at the point where you know, the, um, the improvement body is, is working through its programs and doing really great work, but the needs of people outside are changing faster than we're able to adapt our improvement approaches. So what I'd say is that improvement, as improvement leaders and change agents, we need to move to the edge. And I really like this quote here from Harold Jarchi. And he says, in the near future, the edge will be where nearly all high value work will be done in organizations. Organizational development and change management, and I'd also add quality improvement, needs to move to the edges and quickly. So I'd say, you know, for us, as, as change agents as in, and improvement leaders, we need to be moving to the edge. Now, leading from the edge is a difficult place. And what I've done here in this diagram is I've tried to contrast the kind of um, approaches to change and the way that we've typically done things from the center and contrast them with um, leading from the edge. So, you know, if we think about leading from the center, power comes through hierarchy. Power is positional. The higher we are in the hierarchy, the more power we have. When you're looking at things from the edge, power comes from connection, relationships, who we know. From the center, we're thinking very organizationally centric. So we're looking at the mission and vision of the organization, which is really important. But we live in a world where single organizational change is increasingly unviable. So we have to be thinking as well about shared purpose because we need to be working with patients and families and community members and other organizations. And vision and mission isn't enough. We need to be building massive shared purpose. From the center, we make sense through rational argument, through the use of data, effective planning mechanisms, um, logical ways of uh, thinking about planning change. From the edge, mostly, we work through emotional connection because the evidence is really clear. If we want to mobilize people for change, the most effective way of doing that is to link with emotions through values. Okay. From the center, innovation is leadership driven, um, top down. So, you know, I work with many healthcare systems where the leader says, we've got to take $27 million out of our budget um, within the next six months, and we want to do that by improving quality. So we're going to have an innovation drive. Okay? From the edge, innovation, creativity is much more viral, bottom-up, grassroots. From the center, the kind of improvement methods we use are, are tried and tested based on wisdom and experience. And again, when I look at the, the toolkit of um, improvement methods that has um, served me very well um, for 20 years, I see the benefit of that. But also, increasingly, as we live in a world that is open, where people are connecting with each other all the time, we also need very open, connected approaches where people share ideas, they share data, and we co-create change together. From the center, many of our activities are transactional. It's about fulfilling the contract, compliance, performance management um, um, mechanisms. You know, they're transactional, holding to account for a transaction. Whereas from the edge, everything is about relationships and who we're connecting with. Now, in, in showing you this, I'm not saying this is either or, and that we're going to do less of an A and more of B, because actually A is alive and kicking and uh, likely to, to be with us for a long time. But I think as improvement leaders, we actually need to be able to live in the space between the two and in the place of tension between the two. So, you know, given this world, where does that leave us as improvement leaders? 
and what are the ways that we ought to be thinking about leading for the future. And what I want to do in the rest of um, this session is I want to take you through five ways that I think um, are going to be ways of the future when it comes to leading from the edge. And I'll, um, I'll, t I'll take you through each one. And I'm going to start off with embracing disruption. So last week, John Cotter published a new book, and it's called Accelerate. And it's always interesting to me when John Cotter publishes a new book, because it means interesting things are happening. And um, how many of you have um, worked with models and principles from John Cotter, the eight steps to change? So anybody? Yeah, lots, lots of people. So anybody that goes to business school and does a change management course, we get taught John Cotter, you know, the, the, the eight steps to transformational change, which starts off with, you know, um, build a guiding coalition, create a sense of urgency. And the idea of these eight steps was any organizational leader that wanted to transform their organization could, should follow these eight steps to get there. John Cotter is now saying the world has changed and that isn't enough. He says, any leader of a hierarchy that seeks to make change happen um, through hierarchical means won't achieve what they're seeking to do. Because by its very nature, hierarchy is risk averse. And the change that we can create through hierarchy just won't happen quickly enough or broadly enough. And yet it's amazing to me how many driver diagrams, for instance, that I see in healthcare improvement that have got an absolute assumption of you know, senior leadership uh, working change through hierarchy. And, and I think if John Cotter says the world's changing and we need different mechanisms, then it really does. So, you know, what he's basically saying is hierarchy, yeah, it isn't enough. In a sense, hierarchy is designed for division. Okay? What we do in hierarchy is that we put people into small work units that are the most efficient way of getting things done, but they divide us. I mean, in, in my world of the National Health Service in England, we actually call the way that we organise clinically divisions, you know, the surgical division, the medical division, you know, uh, keeping us apart. What John Cotter says is that, um, you know, of course there are advantages and, and uh, important aspects to hierarchy for delivering change. But we also need networks. We need um, people to organize um, informally. And he talks about dual operating systems needing both. And there are big implications for this. Okay? The first is that we need many change agents, okay? not just a few with a designated role as the patient safety officer or the improvement facilitator. And what it also means is that we have to embrace the spirit of the volunteer. That comes up, the whole issue around the spirit of the volunteer is such a strong theme in, in change thinking of the future. We have to change our mindset. If we want people to get involved in change through the network, then it's about people wanting to, not just having to. It means that we have to um, embrace the spirit of the volunteer and work with the head and the heart and not just the head. And what it means for us as change agents is that we need to be the disruptors. You know, we can't just be the passive people that um, implement the projects that are determined through the hierarchy. We have to be up there leading the way with change. And I like this quote from um, Celine Sillinger. She says, disruption is the new normal. And she says, actually, that people like us, you know, change agents in organizations, like we are the savior of our organizations um, in the new era because we are the people that will question existing ideas. We're the people that will open new fields for action. And we're the people that will help our organizations survive and adapt going forward. And you can really see this you know, across the world. And one of the things I see is this kind of this disruptive internal change agent movement is absolutely exploding. And um, we see it in so many ways in terms of the kinds of networks and groups that are springing up all over the place. And, and these are some of my favorites. So one of my favorites is change agents worldwide. Do you have the backbone, the passion, the conviction to fix the world of work? We are a new breed of change makers rewriting the rules. 
And this is people literally across the globe, people who are change agents in organisations, people who are radical thinkers outside, coming together, wanting to do things in different ways. Um, Rebels at Work, and we'll, we'll look at some more things from Rebels at Work shortly, is, is a kind of global organisation of people who work in organisations, who love their organisations and what they stand for, just hate the way their organisations go about change. So they're actually reaching out and linking up with other people. And Corporate Rebels United is another one. It is, Corporate Rebels United is so cool. Um, this is, if, if you go onto their website, they've got the best manifesto for change agents, I think, that I've ever seen. And we're also starting to see research reports. So this is a recent one. And, you know, seizing the opportunity in employee activism. You know, and, it's, and it's not um, a coincidence that these movements are arising, these kind of reports are being published. And we can ride that wave. And you know what I'd say? The kind of people that we need to be to kind of thrive and survive in this world, to be a disruptor, okay, we need to be boat rockers. We need to be the kind of people that can rock the boat but can also stay in it. And if you look at some of the evidence base around the people that do this really well, this is what we see. You know, the kind of people who can walk the very fine line between being inside the organisation and outside, that's the edge stuff, okay? You know, um, people who can challenge the status quo because we see there could be a better way. But what's important about boat rockers is that we're capable of working with other people to create success. We're not destructive troublemakers. This is one of my really um, favourite kind of slides, and, and this comes from Rebels at Work. And Lois Kelly, who is the leader of Rebels at Work, very helpfully, she contrasts a rebel and a troublemaker. So uh, my question to you is, um, is which are you? Okay. A rebel is somebody who creates change, is passionate about the patient-focused mission of our organisation. You know, we're passionate about, um, about patient care, patient safety. We're optimistic about the potential for the future. Um, we generate energy for change, which attracts people around us. We see possibilities for change, and because other, it, it um, brings other people to us, we work in solidarity with others. That's very different from being a troublemaker, okay? A troublemaker is typically somebody who complains a lot, but the complaint is about me. It's very, very me-focused, the injustice of my situation, how unfair things are. As a troublemaker, I'm, I'm pretty angry about my situation. I'm pessimistic about the potential for change. I sap energy of the people around me, and I alienate others. I see problems rather than possibilities, so people tend to give me wide berth and I stay alone. Now, a couple of things about this. Very often, you know, um, us rebels are in organisations where other people see us as troublemakers. The other thing that happens is very often, you know, I see so many colleagues who started off being rebels, who came into health and care with such a passion and mission um, for improvement, but they, they can't get their voice heard. They, um, you know, they get um, disregarded all the time and they get really angry and cross the slippery slope and become a troublemaker. So I was just going to give you a couple of minutes to just have a chat with the person um, next to you. Okay? So are you a rebel or are you a troublemaker? Okay? What moves people from being a radical to a troublemaker and how do we prevent people falling out of the boat and becoming troublemakers? I'll go back to the slide and I'll just give you a couple of minutes to think about this. So what I want to do now, I just want to show you um, a short case study in, in rebeldom. And um, this is NHS Change Day. NHS Change Day was something that was started in the um, National Health Service in England. And it's a day when people across the whole system take action to make a difference for patients. And we've had two NHS change days. The first one was on the 13th of March, 2013, and the second one was on the 3rd of March, 2014. And um, I've said here, it's probably the largest simultaneous improvement initiative um, in the history of healthcare, probably. 
And, you know, the, the aim of Change Day is to kind of get everybody across the system, frontline staff, people who partner with the NHS, people who use the NHS, to pledge to take one simple act that will um, contribute to better patient care. So on both these days, in 2013 and 2014, it's just been, you know, amazing. And what's interesting is where Change Day started, it actually started with a tweet conversation in June 2012. And it was some improvement people and some um, clinical trainees having a conversation. And what we decided we wanted to do was that we wanted to build a social movement to transform the NHS. But there was a bit of a problem because we didn't have any resources to do it. And, um, and we didn't have any power in the hierarchical um, terms. So we just kind of came up with this idea, we're going to run NHS Change Day. And, um, and it was amazing. So 2013, we got 189,000 people pledging um, to, to, to take an action on that day. When we evaluated 2013, what we found was that 60% of the people that we talked to that had pledged for Change Day said that the effect of change day didn't just happen on a single day, but impacted on their, um, their practice and their improvement activities through the whole year. It's crazy, really, because it's just something that was set up with some improvement people and a, and a group of trainees. Um, last year, it, it won this like, really prestigious challenge award from Harvard Business Review and McKinsey. And it was a Leaders Everywhere challenge. And it was really meant for like, corporate businesses, but we won it for change day. Um, and I think it was a kind of recognition of how special this movement is. And I've put here, it's probably the only winner, NHS Change Day, of a global um, challenge to develop leaders in the, in the corporate world that named Sol Alinsky and Marshall Gans as major influencers. And for those of you who don't know who Sol Alinsky and Marshall Gans are, they're kind of community organisers, direct action activists, um, not the usual kind of people that help in the corporate world, but we were proud of that. And Change Day 2014 um, has just been amazing, okay? Um, it happened, like I said, um, at the, a, a month ago. And um, there were nearly th just under three quarters of a million pledges um, to take action. And the, the, the pledges are amazing. I mean, they, literally, they can be anything. There's such um, a wide range of pledges. Within there, there are 81 um, separate campaigns, so where people wanted to bring people together um, to make a difference. So there's a campaign around, um, hello, my name is, you know, um, so that whenever a member of staff meets a patient, we always start by saying, hello, my name is. There's a campaign around one-page summaries so that members of staff and um, patients create a one-page summary so that everybody understands them. Um, there's campaigns around wheelchair um, access. But it's, the whole thing about Change Day is the spirit of the volunteer. It's, it's all run, literally, by volunteers um, and with, with a massive social media presence. Um, there's, so far, there's been um, 86 million Twitter impressions, 35,500 video views, 95,000 daily reach on Facebook, and just the, the, the reach of it was, was really amazing. And we had a secret weapon, and they're called our hubbies. And hubbies, um, they're, they're the hub leads, um, and they're like the regional organisers across the whole country, and they're students and clinical trainees and young leaders. And it, it was like their regional infrastructure that, that massively delivered this, and they're all volunteers. So what I was going to do was just show you a little film to kind of, that shows the spirit of Change Day and how, you know, in choosing to be a disruptor, we can make amazing things happen. It's a world that is much, much more about relationships and connecting with each other. It's what does Change Day mean to you? Change Day is a collection of all things that could happen on a particular day within the NHS. solution to many of the problems in the NHS, if not all of them, actually, lies in the intellectual capital of the 1.4 million people who work for the yeah. NHS. NHS Change Day gave us and the Trust a mission.
permission to do something different on that day. And we're still doing it, and it's gaining and gaining and gaining the momentum. term called you know how to rock the boat but stay in it and sometimes it's what would appear to be the simplest idea that can have the biggest impact. A pledge is a pledge, no. you know, and uh, it's an intention. It's a feeling, you can't, really, you can't really put it into words but it's such a good feeling and I think everyone that's involved with change day and that's helped to empower someone else and empower yourself you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not something you can put into words and it's not for your CV, it's not for your personal sort of career goals but it's just, it's just really, really nice, and that's what's really good about Change Day. Um, well, there'll be European Change Day, American Change Day, World Change Day, Intergalactic Change Day. Um, I think the consolidation of what you do. And um, we're boat rockers um, in Change Day, and we want you to join us. So go out on a limb, because that's where the food is. <laughs> So, um, it's, yeah, it's this amazing mov movement. And um, I think we've got some really big um, responsibilities in evaluating Change Day. Because obviously, pledging's great, but it's only an intention. And what matters is that um, it's the initiation around doing it and the outcomes around delivering. And we're having to develop um, new methods, I think, to show impact. But we also want to use um, Change Day to build some new theory of large-scale change. But, you know, you get a real sense here of our workforce not waiting around to be given permission to make the change. It's about people getting on with it because it's important and organising themselves. And I think that's the real spirit of the new age. And, and Change Day is spreading. So many other countries. Um, Australian Change Day was on the 6th of March. Swedish Change Day is on the 4th of June. Um, lots of Change Days are happening in other places, and I think it's going to become um, a global movement. So, on to my second topic now, about um, five ways to lead from the edge and thrive. And my second topic is about us as improvement leaders, as curators of knowledge. And like this diagram says, I think that in future we will do much less um, creating and much more curating. And what I mean by that is very often when we're faced with a particular improvement challenge in our organisations, we like create our own way of doing it um, or, you know, often we reinvent the wheel in different places. And I think that in the new era, we, we will be doing much more curating, actually bringing lots of knowledge back from other places. And what do we mean by curation and particularly new age crea um, curation? It's about going out and finding things out and understanding what's valid and what works from what's just noise. It's about linking with networks and communities and understanding where the kind of nodes and connect of connections and amplifiers are. And it's about you know, taking responsibility for high quality knowledge and coherence and not just volume and mass. Because you see there's a problem. You know, there's so much information that's available to us but taking information off the internet is like getting a drink from a fire hydrant. Um, you know, you just can't do it. And I think the big challenge for us in knowledge terms as improvement leaders is that, you know, where the kind of magic is, is in tacit knowledge. Because tacit knowledge is learning by doing. And it's the people with tacit knowledge who deliver the results of change. And if we want to create large-scale, transformational, radical change, we need tacit knowledge. But the only way that tacit knowledge can be um, 
broadly shared and scaled is to turn it into explicit knowledge. And I think it's something that we seek to do very often. It's very difficult and we're uh, often we don't succeed in that. And I think the real key is how can we share tacit knowledge? I think it's a, a big question for the new era. And what I'd say about tacit knowledge, you know, learning by doing, is that the best way that it is developed is through conversations and social relationships. And I think that's where a lot of our thinking has to go. And, you know, thinking about the kind of knowledge and curation models that we need for the new um, era, I think this one's really helpful. Again, this one comes from Harold Jarchi. And he talks about our need to seek and to sense and to share. And seeking is about every one of us as an improvement leader, you know, seeking things out and um, taking responsibility for finding things. But it's also about understanding where are our trusted sources that can get information as well. The sensing part is about taking that and making it into something meaningful that works um, in our context. And you know, turning all that information that we've sought into knowledge that works for us. And then in this new era of knowledge, you know, curating um, is, there's a lot of sharing, connecting and collaborating, and um, doing so in our own, um, in our own local work teams, um, in terms of the, the kind of very specific knowledge we need to do our work, testing ideas out with our wider networks, and then thinking about our, um, our social network communities, um, and, um, and, you know, seeking and sharing and testing far and wide. Number three um, in my list of five is about building bridges to connect the disconnected. And what I mean by this is that I think in future, we as improvement leaders will be spending a lot less time kind of running programs and work streams and a lot more time connecting people up who aren't currently connected. And I just wanted to show you um, one um, set of ideas or one piece of evidence that I think is really interesting. This is an article, The Network Secrets of Great Change Agents, that appeared in the Harvard Business Review in the July-August 2013 edition. And it was written by two Canadian researchers called Batala, um, Bat <coughs> um, Batalana and Caschiaro. And these two Canadian researchers went into a very big organizational system and followed 68 change initiatives around that big system. Does anybody know what that system is that these two Canadian researchers looked at? Yeah, very good. It was, it was the um, British NHS. So, the, so they followed 68 change initiatives around the NHS. And they found out a lot of interesting things, but I think the two most interesting things that they found out. The first thing was, my ability to deliver change is very little to do with my positional power in the organisation. Okay. that is actually where I am in the network and the extent to which I'm connected is far, far more important around my ability to deliver change. And the second thing they said is if we want to create small-scale incremental change, then we work through what they call cohesive networks. And cohesive networks are networks of people like me, so GP to GP, you know, nurse to nurse, manager to manager. But if we want to create radical, large-scale change, then we've got to create bridging networks where we bring people together who are currently disconnected. And I think that's a very big role for improvement leaders in the future, um, you know, bringing together people who are currently disconnected. So rather than set up yet another improvement program in our organization, can we find the people who are doing really interesting things already and, and connect them up and share the knowledge rather than starting another initiative? I think it's something we'll be doing much more of. Number four is to roll with resistance. You know, we talk a lot about resistance to change, and I use that language um, very carefully. And what I want to do is to contrast two approaches to thinking about resistance. And one's called diagnostic, and the other one is called dialogic. Okay? And I use those words because that's how they're framed um, in the literature. But in the world of organizational development, there's a very clear shift from diagnostic-based approaches to dialogic. And I think that we will go there as well as an improvement community. So let me explain um, the, the difference. Okay. 
If we start off with, with what in the literature is called a diagnostic approach, the idea of this is that when, it's, when we're talking about resistance to change, okay, change is something that happens out there. So when I think about the urgent care system or I think about um, the, the pathway for people living with dementia okay, to, to, to get an assessment, then, then it's almost like an external reality that I'm seeking to change. And from a diagnostic approach, we see resistance as something negative. You know, it's a force we need to overcome. Resistance actually prevents change happening. If we're a change agent, what we must spend our time doing is diagnosing resistance, managing resistance, and overcoming it. And often we put very negative names or um, titles on people that we see as resistant, and we call them laggards, we call them blockers, or we say they're in denial. It's interesting, if you look at the literature on resistance, about 90% of it comes from this diagnostic mindset. So, you know, how to overcome resistance to change in your organisation, how to manage resistance to change, minimising resistance to change, not now, not ever, how to dissolve hardcore resistance to change in your workplace. And again, it's this kind of mental model that we're on this road to change, to achieve this goal, and we have to kind of stop people who resist. And this, to me, I just put this quote up here. This is a, a kind of classic quote of somebody who's in that diagnostic mindset about resistance. Um, and this is from David Stonehouse, and he says, the role of the change agent is to recognise the causes of resistance and address each one. If this is not done, then the change will be much harder to implement successfully and may not succeed at all. Again, you know, this idea of me as the improvement leader or the change agent, I've got this specific goal that I've got to achieve and I've got to kind of fight off or put down um, any resistance that gets in the way of my goal. Okay, let's look at this from a dialogic approach, okay? And in a dialogic approach, what we say is that rather than the reality being an external thing out there. People make their own reality. So actually, the way that change results, it comes from having different kinds of confirmation, conversations. Conversations that shift people's mindsets and are therefore transformational. It's about involving many more people and different people in change discussions. It's maybe um, changing the way that people connect and talk to each other. And it's about getting lots of different perspectives and new perspectives and bringing new people into conversations to shape how people think about things. And from a dialogic perspective, resistance is inevitable. In fact, you know, it's something we want because this is a complex change process. And the more diversity that we can get, the more innovation we'll get, so the more resistance we'll get. And that's a good thing, okay? So resistance should be embraced and worked with. So when we're thinking dialogically about resistance, you know, what do we, what's our role as change agents? It's about creating the conditions for people to have com, um, transformational conversations. And it's about asking the kind of questions that helps people to see future possibilities by actually, you know, very consciously inviting diversity into the system, being welcoming, anybody can contribute. And it's about creating the space and the opportunity for people to express their own views and to build on other people's views. And, you know, creating, again, the space for people to reflect together and helping people finding meaning and helping to create a sense of, you know, shared purpose um, amongst people. So I think we'll be in a world that it will be diagnostic and dialogical, but I think that we'll see an increasing approach on these dialogic um, uh, kind of conversations. And I think one thing that thinking dialogically helps with is around the role of diversity. I think too often we regard diversity as a human resources issue um, and, you know, diversity and inclusion and, and making sure that we have a workforce that reflects our population. And yes, that, that is really, really important, but it's not enough. And we've got to think about diversity in terms of different viewpoints um, challenge so that we can you know, innovate um, very radically. And I think diversity is a real issue for us as imp an improvement movement. I think certainly when I look at the improvement movement in the National Health Service in England, I think that um, we have a real lack of diversity. And I think it 
um, it reduces our ability to, to do really radical change. And I just really like this quote, you know. The most basic formula for building an innovation culture is pretty simple. Embrace diversity and start to attract, retain, and promote a diverse workforce that looks different, works differently, dresses differently, speaks differently, and is inclusive of the full spectrum of human sexual orientation and gender identities. And I think this is really wise advice. You know, do this before you start hiring consultants and rethinking your innovation process. There's no process that works without true diversity. I think, again, it's something that we as an improvement movement need to really tackle. Okay, my final topic. And I think that, like, really fundamentally, um, if we're going to lead from the edge, then change has to start with me. It's very easy when you know, we're trying to change a system to look outside and say, well, um, that process needs to change and those doctors need to change the way um, that, that they work and that system needs to change. And again, to see change as this kind of external reality that I'm trying to change and, and really change has to start with me. I love this quote. It comes from David White, who's a corporate poet. And he says, I do not think you can really deal with change without a person asking real questions about who they are and how they belong in the world. And I think that's what we have to do increasingly as improvement leaders. I, I really like this framework. It comes from Peter Fuda, who is an Australian researcher and transformational change thinker. And he's done a lot of research in organizations around what are the characteristics of transformational change agents. And he looks at this at three levels. He talks about doing, seeing, and being change. And, you know, doing change is about having the skills and methods to create change. So seeing change is about being able to look with different sets of eyes um, at, at the same situation and to, to rethink what reality means. And being change is about me every day in all the work I do, you know, living my values as a change agent. In healthcare, which do you think is the most prevalent, would you say, for us as improvement leaders? Where do we mostly focus? Doing, yeah, doing, absolutely. You know, it's where we're putting most of our effort and emphasis. It's what other people will typically judge us on. You know, you need to deliver this change process in this period of time. Um, it's what we often perceive as change agents and improvement leaders that we need to do to add values. And it's what most training focuses on. And I think moving into the future, you know, being fit for purpose for a different kind of change environment, it has to start with me. And I think we have to think about, about seeing and being. Because, of course, doing is really, really important. Okay? We won't deliver what we need to deliver without an absolute focus on doing and um, delivering the change. But actually, if we can also focus on seeing and being, then uh, I think it gives us a much better fighting chance. So here, you know, the idea that change absolutely begins with me. Seeing the possibility of different hopeful futures and opportunities. Seeing change in very different ways. And I think critically in the context of being, seeing myself in the context of like my higher purpose. So I'm not just here as somebody who is a leading change and wanting to deliver this project, but actually I'm here because this is my absolute calling and like my mission on earth to, to do this work. So I'm, I'm actually going to skip my case study because I've run out of time. Um, so we talked there about, um, about five ways to lead from the edge and, and, and thrive. And I think, you know, looking at that environment, we, we all need to think really deeply um, about, about these five things, about how we can be um, disruptive leaders, how we can be creators of knowledge for a new age, how we can build bridges to connect the disconnected, how we can actually embrace um, resistance and diversity, and how we can focus um, very deeply um, on us in ourselves. So um, what I want to do now is I, um, I just want to show you um, a little film that I made um, about the future, another, another digital story. So what might that world um, look like? So um, I want to describe what I see in 2020.
It's 2020. We are a community of improvement leaders. We are many, not just a few. We span boundaries, organisations and hierarchies. We are patient leaders, frontline clinicians and senior leaders. We are massively connected and we collaborate across the globe. We have rewritten the rules on how to lead change. We spend less time running discrete improvement programmes and more time connecting people, ideas and knowledge. We spend less time identifying the best solutions and more time on making sense of things together. We spend less time trying to replicate best practice and more time having transformational conversations, telling stories and ensuring that everyone's voice is heard. We have created a new normal. We embrace diversity and disruption. We roll with resistance, working with dissenting voices, not shutting them out. We work intergenerationally, back to the future, with patient leaders, clinical trainees, students and young leaders at the fore. We are fast forwarding new methods of change, curating knowledge, bridge building, open innovation, digital collaboration. Our past role as change leaders was largely about improving the operational delivery of health and healthcare systems. Now change leadership has become a much more significant, more interconnected component of the way we do things. Change leadership now plays into everything we do, every day, and how we go about getting things done, regardless of positional power or status. In our brave new world, every leader has to be a change leader. Um, I was just going to tell you that I actually made both those digital stories myself. I, um, I went on a training programme with some wonderful um, patient leaders, one of whom is in the audience today, and um, yeah, got taught how to do that. So that's kind of part of my investment um, of it. It starts with me. So, you know, think about this um, in terms of a, a, and this session as a call to action. You know, what are your own opportunities to, to move to the edge, which is likely to be the most effective place for us to be as change agents in the future? You know, think about the mindsets and the skills and relationships that you need for the future. And how can each of us, as improvement leaders, change ourselves at a faster rate than the world outside is changing? Just to say, um, everything I've said, there's um, a great long reference list um, of, uh, of further reading if you want to see that. And, um, and finally, um, if you're interested in the development of these ideas, you can follow the Horizons group um, via um, me on Twitter or NHSIQ, and you can download all these slides from SlideShare. So I hope that's given you some ideas and some inspiration. And, um, and yeah, good luck with your... Um, creating the future that you want as a change agent. Thank you.